What is up, YouTube people? Uh, today I'll be doing a video response to some Theus content. I know, big shock. How very out of character for me. Anyways, today I'll be responding to um, a response to an atheist YouTuber, Emerson Green. Um, his cumulative case for atheism as he presented in his debate with a Catholic YouTuber, John Buck. Uh, the video was uploaded by Adherent Apologetics, but the person who I'm actually going to be responding to and who actually presents the objections of interest is a Christian theist and self-proclaimed aspiring philosopher, uh, Tim, otherwise known as uh, Invoking Theism. Uh, the video is fairly good. Uh, Tim seems like a smart guy. and His objections are philosophically uh, rigorous, um, interesting, and thoughtful provoking. Uh, let it be known that I have nothing against him, um, though having briefly combed through the video, I do take some issue with his points. Um, that is, I, I don't find his responses to you know the arguments from divine hiddenness and evolutionary animal suffering, among others, convincing. Um, and I think it's probably worthwhile to further the discussion by uh, explicating exactly why it is I don't find the responses convincing. Or perhaps I'm just really bored and this is my post hoc way of coming up with a justification for satiating my boredom. Doesn't really matter what my intentions are, I suppose. But, you know, let's begin by letting Emerson present the first argument, the argument from soteriological confusion, as he calls it. First, soteriological confusion. Salvation is a common feature of theism. Some will be saved, and others will not. This is a common belief among theists, far more common than the belief that all shall be saved in the end. Further, theists often imagine the consequences of lacking salvation to be eternally significant, involving everything from annihilation to eternal torment. Once again, very few accept universalism of any kind. Put simply, the stakes couldn't be higher. According to the vast majority of theists, an unmatched catastrophe will result from lacking salvation. That's terrifying enough, but worse is that theists do not agree on what's necessary for salvation. So, most agree that salvation is necessary to avoid terrible catastrophe, but they do not agree, minor detail, on how to get salvation. This kind of soteriological confusion is a matter of course on naturalism. On naturalism, religion is a natural phenomenon, and your religious beliefs are in large part determined by your geography, your familial and peer groups, and your immediate cultural surroundings. It needs to be emphasized that this is not like other disagreements. We disagree over all sorts of issues on how the world works, but typically there's no omniscient person who's trying to communicate to us the right answer. On the other hand, God is a personal being who is trying to communicate to us the right answer to soteriological questions, and yet he's evidently failing to do so. Despite the best efforts of an omnipotent being who has our best interests at heart, we're beset with discord on an issue of infinite significance. I frankly find this impossible to believe. Nearly every attempted explanation devolves into incoherence. To make matters worse, untold millions of human beings, some of them children, have been the victims of psychological terrorism that arises out of this soteriological fog. Naturalists, of course, have no difficulty explaining this kind of discord. It would be very surprising if every religion somehow landed on the same answer about salvation. Actually, it would be evidence for theism if the world's religions and denominations converged where it really mattered. Soteriological harmony would be good evidence for theism. This is not the world we see. On the naturalist view, theists disagree about important religious questions for the same reasons that people wear different kinds of clothes and speak different languages. Geography, familial groups, peer groups, cultural surroundings, and so on. Theists, on the other hand, have to believe that God is trying to tell us the right answer, yet somehow the answer is unclear. God could have communicated in such a way that there was no ambiguity, or designed our minds such that we naturally intuit the right answer. And since he desires what's best for us, he has reason to dispel confusion on this matter of unmatched importance. Clearly the observation of soteriological confusion is evidence favoring naturalism over theism. Right, so the basic idea I take it... <coughs> Sorry, uh, is that on theism we would expect humans to have much more agreement or at least knowledge of matters of great importance such as what is the true path for salvation and what hap happens to those who are not saved. Uh, so we can formulate the basic argument as follows, uh, where C is the data of soteriological confusion, T is theism, and N is naturalism. Or it could just be something like an indifference hypothesis, which would either be that there are no supernatural agents, and all events with prior causes are caused by some antecedent states, together with laws of nature which do not care about human flourishing or well-being or activities. 
Um, or there are supernatural agents which are responsible for the causal nexus of the world, but they are morally indifferent. They, they do not care about human suffering or goodness or, you know, flourishing. Whatever. And K is our background information. So, what premise 1 says is that the probability of soteriological confusion given theism and irrelevant background information is very low. Uh, this is because on theism we have strong reason to expect antecedently since matters of salvation are so important and their very souls are at stake, uh, that God would inform us of the correct view of salvation, or at least provide some process or mechanism by which we could easily access the correct view of salvation. Uh, but this is precisely what we do not see. Uh, by contrast, uh, the probability of C on naturalism plus irrelevant background information is not very low. In fact, it seems pretty high. Uh, it seems more or less what we'd expect, given that we know that humans have widely different uh, cultures and religious practices, which can be tracked back to either you know family upbringing or geographic location in conjunction with the uh, you know the relevant historical and sociological facts regarding them. It would be much more surprising on naturalism, given this background information, if it turned out that there was widespread convergence on matters regarding salvation. Uh, it then follows that uh, the data of uh, sociological confusion, C, is some evidence for naturalism over theism. Right, so now that we've laid out the groundwork, it's time to find out how does Tim respond. But, I mean... All, that, all we really have to do is, are there actually any goods that we can actually identify in the fact that there is, that salvation is not the clearest thing that we can possibly observe in the world? And I think that I can, I can, name, I can name some. So here we have, I wrote down, alethic discovery, moral and spiritual development, cooperation, the highest manifestations of love, etc. I think that this is what comes when there is, um, when things aren't obvious about these things, right? I mean, elitic discovery, that just that just relates to truth, right? I mean, this is what sends you on a truth-seeking adventure, is that you want to know how to reach the union with God. Well, there's a lot of aspects of the world you're gonna you're gonna discover in that in that time. I mean we can read some of the highest spiritual people of uh, of, of non-Christian uh, religions have um, have deeply discovered truths that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, they have developed morally and spiritually. You cooperate with other people, right, in, you know, the endeavor to reach union with God, right? The highest manifestations of love, right? You know, in the goal of wanting others to achieve salvation, um, we go out of our way to to tell them about it because we care about their souls, things of that sort. And so I think that something like universalism or even like a strong pluralism like of John Hick, you know, would provide the best redemptive option for these things, right? And um, just because some people are confused about it doesn't mean that this isn't itself true in the end. And so I think what cares about is that is there an, is there an eschatological um, destiny for those who are confused? And so I think that there is one, which is that all persons will be reconciled to the infinite. Um, so that's that's that on soteriological confusion. So to start off, uh, let me put my cards on the table. I probably don't think the argument from soteriological confusion has as much evidential weight as Emerson probably thinks it does. It doesn't seem to have, you know, much evidential force that isn't already contained in something like the argument from divine hiddenness. But, you know, I guess I'm inclined to say uh, it constitutes some, albeit a weak, evidence for naturalism over theism. Now, uh, Tim's response to the argument is basically to point out that there are some goods that can be obtained as a result of soteriological confusion uh, as he lists, alethic discovery, moral, moral and spiritual growth, uh, cooperation, and the highest manifestation of love, and whatnot. Uh, so there are a few problems with this. For one, it's not obvious that we do often see the achievements of these goods as a result of soteriological disagreement. And in fact, I think what we often see is that is the exact opposite. Uh, people who are committed to certain religious sects uh, with certain beliefs regarding salvation are often deeply entrenched in their views. Uh, they do not have a proper disposition for seeking the truth. Uh, they do not grow. In fact, their, their strong commitment to these beliefs, if they are false, may even hamper their growth. Uh, they are hostile to those with disagreements with them, thinking of them as heretics. So, in fact, it, it increases antagonism uh, and lowers cooperation. <laughs> So even if there are these goods that are often achieved as a result of soteriological disagreement, it seems just as likely that there are these countervailing bads that are derived as well. So on balance, it's not going to be clear that uh, 
God permitting soteriological confusion would be justified in the whole. Uh, so, I suppose the point here is merely pointing out that these goods could be achieved through soteriological confusion is not enough. It needs to be that the soteriological confusion in fact entails more goods than evils, but this seems no more likely than its negation, at the very least it hasn't been shown. Uh, second, it seems God could have actualized a world where there is no soteriological confusion, or at the very least, the methods for resolving such confusion are easily accessible to anyone who seeks them, and these goods are achieved all the same through other means. Uh, he is omnipotent after all, and there are no limits to the options available to an omnipotent being aside from you know, logical possibility. It doesn't take much imagination either. I mean, we see plenty of cases where uh, where we have uh, high manifestations of love, cooperation, and moral growth, and truth-seeking that aren't related to soteriological disagreement, such as familial bonds, friendships, activities related to the arts, sports, intellectual activities such as math, history, and dare I say, philosophy. <laughs> uh, it seems uh, there are a plethora of ways these exact same goods can be achieved, and to no lesser degree, without soteriological confusion. So. Once again, it's not clear that God permitting soteriological confusion for the sake of these goods is justified. Uh, third, even if we forego the first two points, it's yet still going to be far from clear that the goods Tim's listed are such that they outweigh the bad of soteriological discord. Again, if it is our very souls that are at stake, and it could be the difference between eternal bliss and the presence of God, or eternal non-existence, or even worse, eternal conscious torment, which is the received view among you know, the main Abrahamic religions, I think. Uh, how our souls are saved and what happens to them, their eternal fate, and how to achieve salvation, uh, is going to be of utmost importance, to the point where these finite earthly goods, such as love, cooperation, or lethic discovery, are literally infinitesimal in comparison. Finite love and friendships are great and all, but they are surely nothing in comparison to achieving eternal bliss in the pre presence of absolute, unsurpassable greatness itself. Now, Tim seems to be a universalist, I think, at least, uh, which I think goes some ways in diffusing the problem, but my understanding is that universalism isn't a particularly popular view among church fathers and biblical ex exegetes. Uh, if it is true, it seems at least somewhat surprising that God would communicate himself so poorly that the majority of people who represent his religious in institutions and who interpret, uh, who specialize in interpreting his scriptures, will come to the wrong conclusion. Now that's soteriological confusion. I don't find his responses, you know, particularly convincing. But the next argument we're going to be moving on to is the argument from divine hiddenness. Second, divine hiddenness. God's existence is not apparent to many millions of people, even those who are open to having a relationship with God. They simply find themselves not believing, involuntarily through no fault of their own. We can call this the phenomenon of reasonable non-belief. And if you think there aren't any reasonable non-believers, then you need to get out more. So what best explains this fact of rational non-belief in God? Here, we're trying to decide which model best explains the data, as in which does a better job of predicting our observations with the fewest assumptions. It's clear that if our observations are entailed by one model, but not a rival model, then it follows that we have evidence favoring the first model over its rival, since the first assigns a higher probability to our observation than the second. So think about God's obscurity. If naturalism is true, there is no great mystery here. God seems hidden because God doesn't exist. So of course God's existence is not apparent even to many who are open to a relationship with God and even who and even those who desire to be in a relationship in, uh, even those who desire to be in a relationship with God. Comparatively, theists have less reason to expect our observations since if God exists, it's not a given that his existence would be obscured from from human beings with whom he desires a relationship. Genuine divine appearance is incompatible with naturalism, but not on theism. So however likely we are to observe hiddenness in a theistic world, the odds are not as high as they are in a naturalistic world. While theists have a somewhat difficult time puzzling over God's hiddenness, naturalists have no hoops to jump through. We have a very straightforward explanation of divine hiddenness. So um, Emerson Green presents the data of reasonable non-believers. I think what he's actually referring to is what Jill Schellenberg calls non-resistant non-believers. I'll put the relevant reading material in the description. Uh, non-resistant non-believers are people who are open to belief in God and would desire to have a relationship with God, but nonetheless do not find God. 
Um, they come in different flavors, such as people who previously had faith in God, but at some point lost their belief uh, to their dismay. Uh, and then there are those who actively seek God uh, throughout their entire lives, but never find him. Uh, then there are those who just simply don't believe as a result of contingent factors out of their control, such as geographic location, which is what we often see. Uh, now, one important thing that Emerson did not bring up, however, is the demographics and distribution of non-belief. Uh, non-belief differs across cultural and natural borders. For example, China has a dominant atheist and non-theistic religious population, whereas the U.S. has a solid uh, Christian majority, representing the highest Christian population in the world. Saudi Arabia has a 95% Islamic population, which would be uh, at least 95% theists. And Thailand has a 95% Buddhist population, which would be at most 5% theist. Uh, now this can be easily explained on naturalism by appealing to uh, the different historical and socio-cultural stories we can tell about the different regions. Uh, for the theist, however, this is a bit of a puzzle, since not only would the theist need to explain why God permits non-belief, but why he permits it so unevenly across different geographic regions. Explanations such as that the um, non-believers are actually all actively uh, resisting and rejecting God out of either stupidity, anger, or hatred are extremely implausible given this, um, these facts about the demographics as well, since irrationality, presumably, is evenly distributed across the global population. Okay, so once again, uh, the argument can be formulated as follows, where H is the data of non-resistant non-believers, and perhaps we can add their uh, widely uneven global distribution. T is theism. N is naturalism, and K is our background information. So premise one says the probability of H given T and K is low. So the probability that we would expect to see the data of uh, hiddenness on theism plus our background information is low. Two says that the probability that we would expect to see uh, the data of divine hiddenness given naturalism is high. Uh, so it follows that three, the data of hiddenness uh, and the demographics of non-resistant non-belief constitutes some evidence for naturalism over theism. The interesting thing is that his argument actually kind of has a hidden has a hidden assumption that he's debated back and forth with people like Ted Poston, Trent Doherty, and others, which is that he's kind of making this diachronic um, um, argument as well, which is saying that um, because I think as theists we would agree um, that um, that there won't always be hiddenness. But what, what somebody like Schellenberg wants to say is that, no, 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 that's still bad. What he's what he wants to say is that at any point in time, at any time T, where there are sentient creatures um, who are able to, who have the faculties to have a relationship with God, they will, God will make sure that they do. And that's an assumption. And that's an axiological assumption. And I don't think all theists have to share that axiology. So going back to our basics here that I provided in the beginning of the presentation. What goods can be identified? Theism leads us to expect that there are value states. What value states can be identified in the existence of reasonable non-believers? Well, I think that reasonable non-believers provide great value to the world. And this is what someone like Swinburne says. Um, very greatly informed and rational atheists actually help um, people of faith think through their faith in a much more serious and rigorous manner than they might not have in the absence of reasonable non-believers right and so this is one reason why god would permit that from happening that god would god would not do whatever is necessary at all points in time to make sure that they are in a relationship with him this is just one among many many, many reasons but i think that that all it goes to show is that there are some reasons that we can identify and so going back to kind of what i was saying earlier there is this diachronic problem which is that we have the universe here like my little diagram um, we have the we have the universe here, and this is the beginning of the universe's history, uh, and this is our axis of time. And the universe is still progressing forward. We often and this is some this is what theologian John Hout has said. When he points his, points out an understanding that we need to think about the universe kind of having an awakening, right? We think about the universe having here a 13.8 billion year history, and we kind of look back at things in the past or in the present, but. There's still so much more the universe has for us in store. And given a theistic commitment, um, the universe isn't done um, uh, done 
uh, approaching perfection. It's almost in a sense being called by God, right? And so in this stage of our earthly existence, right? I just put here that let's just say this is how long, like the 4 billion years, you know, the earth has been here, right? With and things and, you know, we're in this privileged space, right? Um, diachronically, we observe people, we observe reasonable non-believers, right? We observe a kind of divine silence, right? But that has nothing to say about whether the, f about, the, the universe's history, you know, the eschatological destiny of the universe will actually include what we observe in our earthly existence now. Well, well reasonable non-believers always exist. And, and that's where if atheists and theists are going to have to disagree, is that atheists and theists will say, something like Ben Watkins would say, well, why not just, what's the point of having some now and then, you know, having not any later, right? Why not just have them you no know, reasonable non-believers now. Why not just have a winning relationship with God now? Um, and that's an argument that, that, that they can make, but that's also one that assumes a particular axiology, one um, that Schellenberg is also employing. But the theist isn't necessarily, uh, has to be committed to employing the same kind. We might say that there is, you know, great value in, you know, the struggle in the religious life. So there seems to be two parts to uh, Tim's response here, uh, to the argument from divine hiddenness. The first is that there are goods that are brought about by the presence of reasonable non-believers. Uh, they add intellectual value to the world and challenge believers to think more critically about their faith. In addition to that, um, there is value to the struggle of believing in God in the religious life. Uh, adding these uh, sort of struggles to your total experience of set um, would be a greater good in the whole. The second is that um, the earthly existence, which includes reasonable non-belief, is just a small, perhaps infinitesimal part of the universe anyways. And when we realize that all reasonable non-believers will exist eternally and eventually be reconciled with God, the existence of reasonable non-believers in some tiny temporal part is, you know, insignificant, and God is not at all obligated to reveal himself to reasonable non-believers now. Uh, so a couple things to note. Uh, first is... Um, there is a reason I made a distinction earlier between reasonable non-belief and non-resistant non-belief. I think uh, Tim's objection is slightly weakened if we look at the datum of specifically non-resistant non-belief. Uh, why do I say that? Well, non-resistant non-belief includes um, those who, you know, necessarily includes those who are actively open to belief in God and open to relationship with God. You can have reasonable non-believers uh, in the sense that, of believers who aren't making some sort of uh, rational mistake who choose with their free will to not be open to a relationship with God, uh, who just, just resist uh, belief in God. And perhaps uh, there's some story about how God allows reasonable non-belief for the sake of the greater good of morally significant free will, or something such like. So you can have reasonable non-believers, in that sense, uh, who are voluntarily not in a relationship with God, and you can have the goods entailed from reasonable non-believers challenging the faith, but it's nonetheless the case that God will reveal himself to those who want to have a relationship with him. So there are no non-resistant non-believers. Uh, and, th and this story about what God would do seems to have at least some plausibility to it, uh, since that seems to be the kind of thing a good parent would do. Indeed, that seems to be the picture of the world from the perspective of many believers anyways, at least uh, many that I've talked to. Uh, they think that non-believers have knowingly rejected God or, you know, suppressed the truth uh, in unrighteousness. Second, even if there are these goods that can only be achieved through the permission of non-resistant non-belief, surely such goods pale in comparison to the greater good of having a relationship with God. As Schallenberg says, Nature itself does not have any value that is not a reflection of God. If God is the ultimate and embodies the greatest possible value, a being in which none greater can be conceived would have to be such that no value could exist that did not reflect its value, else a greater being could be conceived, the value of whose life, otherwise the same, in some way was reflected by the value of nature. And the experiences of nature would be richer and fuller if it were experienced as a creation of God, and as reflecting the fullest and richest value of all existing in God. It would, moreover, be immensely richer and fuller if recognized as the generous gift of a God willing to share with finite personal beings the wonders of creation. And of course, the next insight must be that if there could be direct subject-to-subject -subject experience of an unsurpassably rich and wondrous God, 
leading the finite subject to ever more fully apprehend and to be pr progressively transformed in the direction of the life of the fi infinite subject, the opportunity to have such experience would be the greatest gift of all, and the surest and deepest way for God to realize value in and through and for created beings." End quote. Uh, third, Tim's response just doesn't uh, explain the demographics of theism, as well as certain troubling cases of non-resistant unbelievers, such as genuine lifelong seekers who actively search for but never find God, former believers whose once strong faith was shattered by the appearance of the absence of God, and non-believers who don't know of the Christian God simply by virtue of their geographical location and cultural upbringing, but would desire a relationship with God if they knew of him. Why do these kinds of non-resistant non-believers exist? Why did God, you know, create these sorts of people in these sorts of conditions anyways? And why is non-belief so unevenly distributed across the global population? Like, it doesn't seem like God would care about what region a person is born in. Uh, such factors don't seem morally relevant in any case. So why would God actualize a world where people born in Asia are far less likely to believe in him, but people born in Europe are far more likely to believe in him? Tim doesn't explain this. Uh, he points out that non-believers will be redeemed in the future, but the problem is that's not an explanation for the data, so it seems like it's just a very striking coincidence in Tim's view that the data of non-resistant non-believers and the demographics of theism is exactly what we would expect if they were the product of unguided historical conditions and there is in fact no uh, omnipotent God who cares so deeply that we believe in him. Finally. Uh, he tells a story about how the earthly part of the universe is but a small part of the universe um, and non-believers will exist eternally and be reconciled with God. The problem is he doesn't give an independent reason to think the story is true. Um, yes, I know it's probably part of his Christian commitments anyways, I get that. But the problem is, unless he gives an independent reason to think this story is likely to be true, it seems I can just tell an equally plausible story that includes the proposition that non-believers will not be redeemed, and we have no reason to think that Tim's story is a better explanation for the data than mine. It seems Tim has done little more than tack on an auxiliary hypothesis, one that hasn't really been justified as one we should think is antecedently probable, in other words, one that we should think is probable before observing the data. Uh, call this particular problem the problem of independent motivation. Uh, I suspect this this problem is going to be one that's going to come up again for Tim. Right, uh, with that out of the way, I think we shall move on to the argument from evolution. Third, evolution. Life is a product of evolutionary forces, not special creation or intelligent design. On naturalism, there is virtually no other serious contender explaining how humans came about other than evolution by natural processes. It's the only game in town for naturalism. But on theism, God has options. Evolution isn't beforehand a sure bet. God could have used evolution to create life, and some theists believe he did, but he also could have used other methods, methods which are all but impossible on naturalism. So the fact that humans in all life came about through evolution is not surprising on naturalism. There's not really any plausible alternative. For theists, on the other hand, evolution may or may not be true. And in fact, I don't know if you've heard about this, many theists don't accept evolution. It just so happens that the option that turns out to be true is pretty much the only one that could have been true on naturalism. In other words, the odds of evolution are diminished on theism relative to naturalism simply as a matter of probability. There's a smaller number of options under naturalism than on theism. Right, so this argument is from Paul Draper in um, his paper Evolution and the Problem of Evil, uh, which I will link in the description. And once again, the argument can be formulated using Bayes' theorem. The probability of evolution given naturalism and irrelevant background information is one, or you know, maybe not one, perhaps just very, very close to one. I suppose there's the epistemic or conceptual possibility that aliens could have created us or something. But the point is, there are no um, uh, plausible naturalistic alternatives to evolution. Uh, on the other hand, the probability of evolution of theism and our background information is not one, uh, nor is it close to one. There are many ways God could bring about human life, such as a sort of uh, special creation process, or he could have simply created a quicker mechanism through which uh, organisms develop. Uh, evolution seems like far from the most efficient means of creating uh, organisms, or specifically humans. Um, it takes millions of years of suffering, death, and languishing 
So, you know, there, there's at least some reason to think God would not bring about human life uh, using evolution, but there is no equally plausible argument, as far as I could tell, to think that evolution is entailed from, or even probable, on theism. Now, let's get to Tim's rejoinder. It, for one, it just gets the probability calculus wrong. Um, and I want to big shout out to Trent Doherty for being the one that showed me this. Um, first showed me this. I did not come up with this by myself. I want to fully give credit to him for that, but I understand it enough to be able to communicate it. So it gets the probab probability calculus wrong. Let's do a little exercise. Let's say that person X gets a 10% raise while person Y got a 5% raise. The question here is who is being paid more? Who has the higher income? Well, someone may say, well, person X, they got a 10% raise. That's five more than person Y. But you can't really make that judgment without actually knowing what they were making prior to the raise. So mm -hmm. here's, an here's an illustration. Boom. This is what Draper and Emerson is arguing. They're saying that, well, since all that, all only thing that, uh, that can happen on naturalism is that there's evolution all the time, 100%, boom, shade that in. But on theism, you can have 50% evolutionist, which is 50% special creation. Given that programmatic assumption, we'll just give that to them. You know, we don't have to accept that, but this is the way they're framing the argument. But again, the problem here is that who actually gets, which theory actually gets the greater proportion of the outcome space? Well, we need to know what the outcome space actually is. So let's look at that. What the correct calculus should be is this. Take any um, uh, axiological precondition that theism has as its evidence, such as an orderly complex universe. And let's just look at the orderly complex universe outcome space. Why? because an orderly complex universe is a precondition for evolution and special creation. But yeah, it's mainly a precondition for evolution, so we're focusing on that. This is what it really looks like, is that you have the entire outcome, uh, orderly complex universe outcome space in regards to evolution and special creation. But since theism has an orderly complex universe as its evidence, and since its evidence is a precondition for evolution, therefore, Theism will get the greater proportion of evolution than naturalism will. Naturalism will get a sliver of it because that's all it can have. But since its evolution is within the orderly universe, uh, orderly complex universe outcome space, theism will get the greater proportion of it since it has this as its evidence. So this is actually what's going on here. You have to, you cannot just look at things by themselves. You have to look at it in terms of the outcome space. This is how proper Bayesianism is done. So Tim's objection, I take it, is essentially that the evidence is understated. What we should be conditionalizing on is what is the probability of there being an orderly complex universe given theism and naturalism. Since an orderly complex universe um, obviously is a precondition for evolution, but an orderly complex universe is evidence for theism, so when we conditionalize on an orderly complex universe, naturalism only takes up a small portion of the pro evolution probability space, and theism gets a bigger piece of the pie, so to speak. So, um, the first point to make, and a, you know, it, it's a fairly obvious point, I think, is that the claim that an orderly complex universe is evidence for theism over naturalism just hasn't been justified. Uh, presumably, no naturalist would accept that, and I think there are good reasons to reject it. Why think God would desire to create an orderly complex universe rather than a simple universe? Why think God would desire to create a universe at all? Since, you know, God is the greatest conceivable being and you know, the greatest possible good. There is no good-making feature missing from God, and the value of the universe is merely an imperfect re resemblance of the uh, value already present in God. It seems the possible world where God exists sans creation is at least just as valuable as a world containing God plus some imperfect creation. Uh, whatever goodness creation entails will just be a lesser goodness in comparison to the goodness already exemplified in God. Now you might be tempted to argue, no, 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 there is a good qua world that isn't present through God. Uh, let's say a plurality of beings and the possibility of those beings having a relationships with God and each other. Um, 
But even if we grant that, again, God could create a plurality of beings without a universe. He could create angels and spirits who, who have jo joy and experience everlasting union with God and have love for God and each other and friendships. Um, so it's not clear if God's desire is to maximize value in the world. And keep in mind, that's Tim's point, right? There's axiological constraints uh, on theism. Um, but it's not clear if God's desire is to maximize value, that God would create a universe at all, let alone an orderly complex universe. But, you know, we can actually set that aside for now. The main issue with Tim's response is that he fails to take into account that an orderly complex universe is just part of the background information, K, for both hypotheses, theism and naturalism. What we are asking is not what is the probability that we have both evolution and an orderly complex universe on naturalism versus theism. Rather, the question is, what is the probability that evolution is true, given that we already know we have an orderly complex universe and complex organisms, since that's just part of the background information for both theism and naturalism. Paul Draper even makes note of this in his original paper, lest you make this very mistake. Quote, It is important to recognize that the probabilities in question are to be assessed relative to the background knowledge that various complex life forms exist. Thus, the issue is not whether complex life together with evolutionary mechanisms with a, with a, sorry, together with the evolutionary mechanisms that produce it are more surprising on theism or on naturalism. Again, whether or not there is a good anthropic design argument supporting theism is beyond the scope of this paper." End quote. And you can replace various complex organisms with an orderly complex universe and the point remains. In light of these problems, I conclude that Tim's objection uh, to the argument from evolution is a failure. Moving on to evolutionary animal suffering. Fourth, evolution, uh, animal suffering and evolutionary history. So there's an additional reason evolution is surprising on theism relative to naturalism, a far more important reason. For hundreds of millions of years, an unimaginable amount of predation, carnivory, starvation, parasitism, languishing, death, fear, and pain has taken place on Earth. This is due entirely to God's choice to bring about his creation through the pitiless process of evolution. This is the way a perfect being brings about his creation. He could have created the biological world in many different ways, including ways in which many millions of Christians already believe he did, without hundreds of millions of years of animal suffering that could have been avoided entirely. It's truly hard to exaggerate the staggering amount of suffering endured by sentient creatures over the generations of evolutionary history, most of which were non-rational, non-moral agents. This is more than just a little surprising on the hypothesis that an omnipotent, perfectly loving, and moral being is responsible for the natural world. Uh, so this argument is from Paul Draper from various papers, his most well-known being Pain and Pleasure and Evidential Problem for Theists. It is a Bayesian argument from evolutionary evil. Uh, it can be formulated as follows, where O is the datum of evolutionary animal suffering, uh, and Draper devises the facts about pain and pleasure's connection to survival and reproductive success including facts supported by moral agents experiencing pain and pleasure, which uh, have biological utility, facts supported uh, about not sentient non-moral agents experiencing pain and pleasure that have biological utility, and facts supported about sentient uh, beings experiencing pain and pleasure that do not have bi biological utility. And he gives reason to think that each of these facts are independently more likely on the hypothesis of indifference than theism. Um, in case you don't know what the hypothesis of indifference is, it's the hypothesis that if there are supernatural beings that are responsible for the causal network of reality, they are morally indifferent. So it doesn't entail that there are or are not supernatural beings. Uh, it just entails that whatever processes are responsible for the causal ne nexus of the world, they are indifferent. Right, and you can also uh, uh, further divide uh, facts about evolutionary suffering into facts about flourishing and languishing as well. Um, there's a lot you can do, and there's a lot to say about these sort of arguments, and I haven't even begun to do it justice. I encourage you to read Paul Draper's work if you want to learn more. But for the purposes of uh, this discussion, we can take O to be the conjunction of all the relevant facts about evolutionary animal suffering. So premise 1 states that the probability of O given naturalism and their background information is very high since we know that organisms evolve in such a way that their functions systematically contribute to survival and reproductive success, we should expect pain and pleasure to work the very same way. Uh, and it's expected on naturalism in conjunction with uh, 
natural selection that predatory animals would evolve to feed on other animals. Um, since we know that animal bodies are a very rich source of nutrition, and by eating plants, herbivores, animals themselves become an available food source. And so there are immense uh, survival benefits to evolving to be able to catch and kill them, um, to eat them. And predators, uh, we know, fill an ecological niche as well. Uh, in addition to that, we know parasitism to be a very successful survival strategy. Um, so we would expect parasites to successfully evolve. Uh, the point is, on naturalism and unguided evolution, evolution uh, simply doesn't care about moral considerations. Genes which are good at surviving and reproducing will just proliferate. Premise 2 says that the probability of O on naturalism, uh, sorry, uh, the probability of O on theism, sorry, is very low. Pleasure and pain have moral value. So since on theism we would expect God to be motivated by moral considerations, we have much less reason antecedently to think that pain and pleasure would play the same role of systematically contributing to the biological goals of an organism like any other biological function. On theism, we would expect God to permit, permit suffering, especially uh, particularly horrendous suffering, only if he has a morally sufficient reason to do so. Uh, so it's nothing short of an amazing coincidence on theism that pain exists in organisms and happens to play the same biological role for survival as other traits selected by evolution via natural selection. In addition, we have no reason to expect that God would cr you know, create a process or mechanism through which animals evolve through millions of years, traits that allow them to more easily devour and rip apart the flesh of other animals while alive and awake for the sake of their own survival and at the expense of others. Uh, seems God would only do that if he had a good moral reason to do so, but we have no reason at all, antecedently, to think that there is a good moral reason uh, for, such, for things such as uh, evolutionary predation. Uh, same with horrifically painful parasitism, which consumes the flesh of, uh, or organs or brain cells of the host. Uh, we have no reason, antecedently, to think that there is an outweighing moral reason for any of these things, let alone that there happens to be an outweighing moral reason that corresponds to every single instance of evolutionary animal suffering as a result of diseases, predation, parasitism, uh, brutal fights over resources and mating, etc. But there would have to be, uh, if theism were true. It follows that O is strong evidence for naturalism over theism. I think this is a solid, inference to the best explanation argument, and one of the most powerful arguments for atheism. But without further ado, let's delve into Tim's response. This is how I understand the dynamic of evolutionary animal suffering. It's a kind of a story, right? There has been a profusion of animal suffering over the multi-billion year process of biological evolution on Earth. In the course of this process, harsh conditions such as competition and predation are required for the proliferation of many species. Our natural history has shown us that there have been multiple mass extinction events, which have been documented as key drivers of evolution in the past. Moreover, many of the adaptive structures evolution has produced are solely for harming, solely for the harming of other creatures. For example, the executor wasp, um, with its, um, I think it has, in terms of a wasp species, has like the worst venom. Um, out of um and so that's just mainly there to harm creatures so the naturalist is saying here well god could have easily chosen a more straightforward path in achieving diversity in the biosphere and at the same time prevent any of the many evils that could have occurred you know um god could have um you know made things where the environment only allows us to give rise to structures that um, are more in harmony with other creatures or things of that sort, right? Mm -hmm. Why does biological evolution kind of have this kind of evil natural law in place where certain creatures to survive have to take out other creatures? But so then the question becomes this, now that we have the datum taken seriously, fully in place, is the theist able to screen off the disconfirmatory power of evolutionary animal suffering? And so when it comes to a criteria of success for theodicy, giving an explanation of evil, I take Trent Doherty's criteria, which is this. We must be able to tell a plausible and constant, consonant narrative um, on theism that is able to screen off the, the disconfirmatory power of the argument from evil. 
Um, and so the more probable the the Odyssey is, the greater it can do that. Mm. And so what we're looking for here is an undercutting defeater. Mm. And so now the question is, does the theist really have one? Um, so if you want me to continue on, I can, but- Yeah, keep going. Continue. Okay. So the data of evolutionary animal suffering is more, is what's being said here, is more prima facie epistemically friendly towards indifference. It's not that it's being substantially predicted by naturalism, it's just that naturalism isn't against it, whereas mm -hmm. theism seems to be against it. Um, I understand indifference to be that there are no normative constraints on value, disvalue distributions, and so it leaves the outcome up to chance. There are absolutely no selective selection pressures on the range of worlds that will come about. Just unadulterated metaphysical chance. So. All the theist has to do is just provide a constant and plausible narrative that is probable on theism to screen off with this confederatory power. Um, and so some might say, that, say that's a big task, but again, a intentional being will always do better than chance. And so if we can do better than chance, we're in a really good spot. Um, and so um, I think that we can do better than chance. I already take issue with him framing it as theism versus pure chance, as if naturalistic hypotheses can't have any predictive power whatsoever in this context. Uh, this is just false, I take it. You can have a naturalistic hypothesis which includes certain known regularities or laws of nature in conjunction with uh, antecedent conditions uh, as part of the background information, and obviously this background information would be conjoined with a theistic hypothesis as well. But the point is, these facts, when conjoined with naturalism, can make it the case that some states of affairs are more likely than others, or perhaps even uh, entailed from the hypothesis with enough specificity. Indeed, we've already seen how we can do this for uh, evolutionary animal suffering. Given our background information regarding natural selection, uh, and that organisms are evolving uh, goal-directed systems, we would expect the selection of traits that systematically contribute to the biological goals of survival and reproductive success. And so, uh, we would expect pleasure and pain to play the same roles as well. So Tim is uh, wrong that it's going to be enough to just say, uh, well, we can do better than chance. Uh, the bar is a lot higher than that. So all we need to do is provide a reason. We can even provide a partial reason. All we have to do is provide a reason, but I think that given um, how I look at theodicy, that we can truly um, screen off the disconfirmatory power here, not only just through looking at the goods that have occurred and the values that have occurred, but fully justify it through having a defeat-enhanced view of theodicy. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just keep going. So let S represent a theodical narrative about evolutionary animal suffering. S is this, all animals who are victims of evolutionary suffering will be resurrected and deified to compensate and defeat their suffering, to endorse the life they live. Oh, I probably typed this out. I typed this out late last night, so forgive the typo. Um, they lived in the context of the drama of creation. So that's the um, theodical narrative we're telling. So the question is, how does, how? Someone might ask, well, how does this not reduce the, pro the probability of theism, right? Wouldn't this take a, take a hit to our priors, right? Because it seems as though we would have to build this entire story into theism for it to work, right? But mm -hmm. that is not true. What we're doing here is we're thinking about it this. God will always do the best loving action. Thus, the best action in this case will be to resurrect and deify animals for compensation and defeat. Now, this is an assumption. Someone could disagree with my assumption here on axiology. But that's not a dispute about God. That's a dispute about axiology. And so okay. we're still fine here. As long as my assumption goes through, which I think I, I can defend my assumption, but I don't really need to. It's not required because it's consistent with an axiological framework. Um, then if God will always do a best loving action, if X is a best loving action, then God will do it. And I think the best loving action for the victims of evolutionary suffering is to resurrect and deify them so that they can mm -hmm. compensate and defeat their own sufferings. So what we have here is um, T 
T implies S, which entails that T is logically equivalent to T and S. What that means mm -hmm. is that theism implies the theodical story I'm telling here. And that just entails that theism is identical to theism in conjunction with S. And if that's the case, then there is no loss in probability since theism is, since theism is would then be logically equivalent to mm. the theory in conjunction with the story. Because mm. God will do the best loving action, the probability of one that God will do the best loving action. So this then successfully screams off the disconfirmatory power without a loss in probability. Now, the question becomes, we can ask is, well, there's just so much horrendous suffering in the process and things of that sort. That's true. I am going with a normative constraint on mm -hmm. what is considered justified and unjustified on theism. I take uh, a Chisolmian and, a, and, and an approach from Adams when it comes to um, value holes. I think that God is justified in authorizing evils if they are defeasible. What it mm -hmm. means is that if these evils can end up being integrated into an individual's life such that it contributes to that individual's life being good on the whole, such that they endorse the life they lived, not in spite of the evil, but through it. Yeah. Um, and I think that all the evils that we have observed in the world are those kinds, that if a creature allows themselves to um, integrate the evils into their lives, then they will defeat it. And defeat mm -hmm. is just, it is, it is a screening off relation. It screens off the hold that an evil has on a creature. When we, for example, heal our trauma, we are basically swallowing the negative impact it had on us and no longer has a negative impact on us. And so this is a kind of a defeat augmented response to animal evolutionary suffering. And since I can tell, since this story um, can go through without any loss in prior probability, then then the job has been done that we have six we can we have successfully screened off this this confirmatory power without loss in probability so there are a couple things here um he starts by adding s which is that all animals who are the victims of uh, evolutionary suffering will be resurrected and deified to compensate and defeat their suffering uh, to endorse the life they lived in the context of the drama of creation uh, he adds that posit to theism and additionally claims that doing so does not lower the prior probability of theism um, it, as it is just entailed from theism because God is all loving and will always do the best action for all creatures. The problem is, well, this just seems to be pretty clearly false. Um, theism doesn't entail that there are animals, let alone that there are animals who are the victims of horrific suffering through the brutal process of evolution. How is the entailment derived here? It seems what Tim actually has to say is that God desires to uh, create animals and uh, permit um, animal suffering and then you know, proceed to resurrect and deify them and compensate them for their suffering. But I don't think that's an entailment from theism at all. And tacking that auxiliary assumption onto theism clearly does reduce its prior probability by a lot. And also runs into the issue of independent motivation I mentioned before. Why would we expect antecedently that God would have that particular set of desires, uh, bringing about animals and uh, um, adding them to the created order, as opposed to um, some other set of desires? Uh, it just seems arbitrary and ad hoc unless Tim actually justifies it. On the other hand, maybe he wants to say that theism in conjunction with the data we observe of evolutionary animal suffering jointly entails that the theodical narrative that animals will be resurrected and deified and yada 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 um, is true uh, since God is all loving. But even if we grant that, uh, it just seems that he hasn't, he hasn't explained the data at all. He hasn't ex explained why God permitted ev uh, evolutionary animal suffering in the first place, uh, which seems to be a prima facie immoral act. Uh, this is the entire point in dispute, so it seems like he hasn't addressed the argument at all. So I'm just sort of uh, left perplexed by uh, Tim's objection here. 
Second, he makes the point that God compensates everyone for their suffering and that evil is defeasible, which means it can be defeated so that it is no longer um, so bad that it has such a negative impact on us for the rest of our lives and we learn to develop and, uh, ex and learn through experiencing it. Um, there is an obvious problem here though, and that is that compensation is not justification, and neither, it seems, is the fact that the evil is defeasible in the sense Tim laid out. Uh, to see this, uh, let's say I rape someone and then compensate them with a million dollars. It may be that the million dollars benefits them more than the rape negatively affects them, and they may even be able to, uh, quote unquote, defeat the trauma from my raping them and even learn to develop and grow from it. Uh, does that mean I was morally justified in raping them? Uh, no, uh, clearly not. Clearly my raping them was still uh, morally impermissible, regardless of the positive effects of soul building and my compensating them afterwards. And the same would be true if I sat back and passively watched someone rape them. It has to be that the good brought about by the evil is not merely compensatory, but entailed for the greater good of the sufferer. But regardless, uh, we can continue and see what Tim has to say. Um, there's this really good paper by um, Trent Doherty, actually. And Zach, I can send it to you if you want to read it. It's a kind of yeah. obscure. I had to find it. I found it mm -hmm. in a footnote and I had to just go look for it. It's called a quasi-Leibnizian theodicy. Okay. The best... Uh, the subset of the best possible kind of world. And so what it is, is it's Leibnizian in the sense that God still creates a best, but it's quasi-Leibnizian in the sense that it's a subset of a best possible kind of world. And mm -hmm. so what God wants to do is he wants to make sure that his worlds are sufficiently good on the whole. Um, and that's going to be really determined by the values realized in that world. Um, and so all God has to do is create a token of the type best possible kind and that's a subset of that and these tokens are allowed to be incommensurable with one another there is no restriction on that they can be incomparably valuable to one another so god kind of just through a chancy process of just mental toss-up he can choose what token world um will realize the best possible kind of world a member of that right and so mm -hmm. this gets into what trent utilizes in that paper is Peter Van Eenwagen's disjunctive model of creation, which he talks about in his paper, The Place of Chance in a World Sustained by God, where basically what God does is he says, allow these values to be realized, but then he doesn't determine the details of that. He lets the world unfold on its own. He keeps the outcome open-ended on how that's going to occur, right? So God may say, let there be embodied moral agents, but he doesn't specify whether or not they're gonna be carbon-based. Um, so he creates a token world of the type that will realize embodied moral agents. And that can be done through an evolutionary process, that could have been done through some other kind of process, but that's the kind we observe. And so abductively speaking, we observe a token of the type. Now the question is, do we actually observe a token of the type? So uh, what we have to ask ourselves is, is our world kind of a crucible for moral, spiritual, um, alethic development, where we're given enough opportunity, opportunities and chances of success to grow through our sufferings and to actually mm -hmm. exemplify some of the highest goods. And I think that theism is able to hit that target uh, and has hit that target. Um, there are many more um, saintly exemplifications than there are horrors that have absolutely um, prevented people from ever basically living their lives. Mm -hmm. Whereas on naturalism, it could have resulted in a world where the distribution of evil is such that there's horrors all the time and people are never able to live their lives or such that the laws of nature don't allow the world to be predictable enough to where we can grow from our suffering, or that the world is too pleasurable and there's no chances for discomfort so we can actually grow from our suffering. Mm -hmm. whereas, the, whereas the world we live in is one where there's significant pain and suffering because this is our preconditions for the best values, such as the highest virtues, love, manifest, 
love manifesting virtues. And so theism is able to do better than chance in hitting that world. And I think that the best possible kind of world is one that realizes the highest virtues and God just instantiated token of that type. Right, so let's quickly summarize. Um, Tim presents the theodicy here, uh, the theodicy that God will actualize the token of the type best possible kind of world. Uh, and worlds which are tokens of this type are incommensable with each other. Uh, this is from a Trent Doherty paper, uh, quasi Leibnizian Theodicy. I'm just going off of what Tim says. I haven't read the paper. And the basic idea is that this is a token of the type best possible kind of world. It just happens to include the evolutionary evil we see. I have a few problems with this. Uh, few, for one, it seems intuitively false that this world is the best possible kind of world. Intuitively, a world just like this one, but where being burned or mauled alive is not linked to as horrifically agonizing sensations as they are in this world, uh, seems to be better uh, to be a better world. Or imagine a world otherwise the same as ours, but with no uh, baby cancer, malaria, skin diseases, flesh eating parasitism, and other horrors, or at least uh, less cases of those things. I have a pretty strong intuition that that world would be a better world than this one. Or we can look at uh, cases like these I found in news articles. Uh, the deaths of three children who were discovered unconscious in the Brooklyn sh shoreline this uh, week have been ruled homicides. All died from drowning. Ten-year-old girl raped and killed in Karachi's Kashmir colony. It definitely seems the world would have been better had these cases not happened. Uh, we can continue to look at massive, a massive conjunction of cases like these. And it would be very surprising if it didn't turn out to be true for at least one of these kind of cases, that the world would have been better had it not happened. Uh, but the second point uh, to make here is, even if it turns out to be true that this world is the best possible kind of world, unless we're consequentialists, the total value of the relevant states of affairs present in this world does not determine the moral status of actions. Uh, like any good consequentialist, it seems wrong to permit the horrific agony of intrinsically valuable rational beings, as well as um, non-rational sentient beings as a mere means to bring about some greater good. Uh, Tim, Tim may not share this uh, deontic intuition with me, but I think it can justify my deontic beliefs. And given uh, that I take myself to be justified in these beliefs, I am warranted in rejecting the quasi leibnizian theodicy Tim has put forth just out the gate. Uh, my previous points um, would be redu uh, rebutting defeaters if they went through, but I think a third undercoming defeater undercutting defeater is to note that uh, Tim hasn't actually justified why we should think the story he tells is likely to be true prior to observing the data. Indeed, why well, think it's true at all that a token of the type best possible kind of world would be one um, that includes uh, embodied moral agents but also includes the precise frequency distribution um, uh, of horrendous evils um, we observe, uh, where sentient beings suffer and languish for millions of years due to brutal predation and parasitism, uh, includes uh, natural evils such as diseases and disasters, uh, particularly horrendous moral evils as well, and the potential for developing and being motivated by the most vile sins and depravities. Um, it really does seem like I can tell an equally plausible story that this is a token of the type worst possible kind of world, and cite as my evidence uh, all the horrific suffering we see, and say, well, uh, the world is all the more bad that there are embodied moral agents to experience them, as well as the possibility for the second order of evils such moral agents can exemplify, such as cruelty, sadism, hatred, perversion, greed, etc. Uh, or you can tell a story about how this is a mixed world, somewhere in the middle of the value spectrum, uh, since it contains the highest virtues and vices, uh, and the greatest pleasures and the worst pains. The only re reason Tim gives to think that this is the best possible kind of world is that um, it's a crucible for the highest virtues and saintliness. Uh, but Tim, in fact, gives no reason to think antecedently that his story is more probable than these alternative stories I've just come up with. Uh, these stories very literally do seem very roughly uh, equiprobable to me. Uh, antecedently. Uh, it seems um, like any reason you could give to think that um, this is the best world, um, an equally plausible reason can be given to think that this is a worst or mixed world. So since we have no antecedent reason whatsoever to think this world is a best possible kind of world rather than a worst possible kind of world or a mixed world, or at least uh, the reasons balance each other out at best, uh, tacking this unjustified auxiliary assumption onto theism uh, lowers its uh, prior probability, thus to use an analogy Draper likes, uh, leaving it further behind in the race against naturalism as an explanation for the data. 
finally, we can end this with an obvious point, uh, since we are looking at specifically evolutionary animal suffering. Animals are not moral agents, so Tim's appeal to the highest virtues and the existence of embodied moral agents to justify the existence of uh, years of evolutionary evil inflicted upon non-moral agents cannot possibly be sound. But we can move on to uh, Tim's attempt to justify cases where a soul-building theodicy doesn't seem sufficient to justify the uh, evils in question. Well, why is the world so messy in the way that it achieves that? Well, it's because God creates disjunctively. He leaves it open-ended. He allows the world to co-create in achieving those ends. And so now someone may ask, well, isn't there too much suffering, right? That if we look at the outskirts, right? if we look at, you know, on the sides of the bell curve, right? Aren't there horrors that have taken people's lives where they never really were able to develop their character? And what we can ask in that sense is, well, were those evils the type that if the process plays out long enough, that person will be able to grow morally, ethically, spiritually in those ways? And there's a lot of literature and there's a lot of biographies. And there's one, there's a book I like, it's um, called uh, A Grace Disguised, basically how horrific, it's basically a book on how horrific suffering can actually make your life better. And it's a guy who basically lost his entire family like that in a car crash kids and wife um, mm. didn't know how to, to live on, but he wrote a book on how that was actually a grace disguised. Our world produces stuff like that all the time. You, you just have to read about it. Um, so I think that, um, that in that sense, then um, that there, the kinds of evils we observe are such that when the process plays out and, and, and runs its course, that people develop in those great ways. And so our world is a crucible for saintly uh, uh, exemplifications and character, whereas naturalism could have hit on any distribution of evil. Why did it hit on the distribution of evil where people like that exist, that write mm -hmm. about how it's a grace disguised? So I think that um, that's very surprising on naturalism, but not surprising on theism. So I have one more slide. I'm gonna let you jump in and give your thoughts because I talked about Yeah, that. I mean, I don't have, too much i want to add just for the sake of like time here um but I, I do think it's like really interesting what you're talking about tim um what i've been trying to map is like i'm trying to think about like like what emerson's gonna be thinking about as you listen to this um because i know what emerson i think what he's trying to do is like point out a specific like example of like suffering um because we're just like the general course of like evolutionary suffering and saying like all other things being equal like this suffering is just more likely on atheism than it would be on theism and the move you're trying to make is like actually like an entailment of theism um, is that there would be some sort of like um, theodicy or some sort of like um, some sort of like you have your on your sides here a, the, a theodical a the, a the, a theodicia, whatever that word theodical would be theodical narrative um, that's kind of like entailed by theism so like that move where we're gonna say like this is just like an entailment that there would be this indifferent suffering um, you're gonna say like and on your view, like, well, that would be an entailment of theism too. So it's not really like either one's really going to have an advantage here. Um, yes. Yeah, exactly. Because we screened off the disconfirmatory power. Mm -hmm. This can no longer be evidence for naturalism. Okay. Um, so that's, yeah, that's exactly what's kind of going on there. And yeah. in a sense, the distribution we do observe is actually evidence for theism. Since it's a probability of one that God will create the best possible, will, will create a best and if we live in a token world of the type best possible kind of world, then the probability of one God will create it. Therefore, theism actually predicts the kind of distribution of suffering we observe. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we can actually not only disconfirm, screen off the disconfirm confirmation, but actually get a confirmation. Some mm -hmm. people don't like that idea, but I think about it, I think if you think about it long enough, um, like for example, there's a woman, uh, Secord, she wrote a, I think she did a dissertation on animal suffering, and she uh, responded to Trent and, on, on his fine-tuning argument from evil. And she said, well, what about people like a mother and her starving family who died from starvation? Um, and Trent's response to that is, yes, but the process will still play out. Mm -hmm. If let, Let's say that they never died from starvation. The process would play out long enough to where they would... That, 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 that gave them significant opportunities and a significant opportunity to be able to grow from the suffering. And then the chance of success is made in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So if the suffering is the type that gives you an opportunity to grow from it, 
then theism has successfully predicted that, that range. So Tim attempts to address the uh, issue of evils that, as far as we can tell, do not seem to be conducive to soul building and character development, uh, such as cases where people are brutally tortured and killed with no chance to grow from it. Um, and his response is that they are still evils of the type that they could be defeated if the process plays out long enough um, in the afterlife or in heaven, um, which is obviously what Tim takes for granted. There are issues, though. He gives no uh, antecedent reason to think that the process will actually continue to play out, or let alone uh, that the process will actually play out in such a way that the suffering of all sufferers um, is in fact defeated in the end. Um, if we don't look at the data with any theory-laden prior commitments, uh, it seems equally antecedently probable that the evil in question uh, will not be defeated. Uh, the story Tim tells about the evil being defeated may fit with uh, Tim's Christian commitments, but unless Tim gives a reason to think that his story is a better explanation of the data than any disjunction of rival stories, um, his response is just impotent and he suffers once again from the problem of independent motivation. Uh, notice this isn't a problem for naturalism though. On naturalism, once we take evolution by natural selection to be part of the background information for how organisms develop, we actually do have antecedent reason to expect the data of evolutionary animal suffering. So another issue is, uh, it seems that Tim has made it the case that uh, no states of affairs we observe could disconfirm the theistic hypothesis. Thus he's made the theistic hypothesis untestable and even more explanatorily and theoretically and virtuous in comparison to naturalism or specific naturalistic alternatives. This is bad news for the theist because I think theism already loses um, in terms of theoretical virtues on ontological economy, simplicity, fit with their background knowledge, uh, and, you know, unlike something like uh, the project of methodological nat uh, naturalism, uh, it's not part of a progressive uh, research program, uh, which we which has a long uh, history of uh, generating successful pre predictions. Um, for those wondering, I'm listing the uh, Dawesian criteria for the kind of uh, theoretical virtues we want to see in grand theories of this kind. Uh, which you can find in Theism and Explanation, which I will uh, also put in the description. Anyways, the point here is, uh, Tim has made Theism entirely untestable. Uh, testability is assessed in terms of the states of affairs we can observe, which would be inconsistent or unlikely on the hypothesis. But what states of affairs could we possibly observe on Tim's view that would disconfirm Theism? I could literally point to cases like the Holocaust and horrific cases of uh, Nazi experimentation on Jews, or cases like uh, Dominic Calhoun, a four-year-old child who was severely tortured, beaten, burned, and killed as a result of days of uh, cruel abuse by his mother's boyfriend, and Tim will just say, yeah, but the evil is defeasible, um, and those people can develop uh, from the evils in heaven, such that the evil contributes to the value of their lives in the whole. But it seems like any seemingly disconformatory states of affairs I could possibly point to, uh, Tim could just say the very same thing. So theism uh, rules out no states of affairs we could possibly observe, so it's completely untestable um, and uninformative. Despite this, uh, Tim seems happy to essentially cherry-pick instances of valuable states of affairs and claim them as confirmation for the theistic hypothesis. But it's far from clear that Tim has earned the right to make that sort of move, since, counterfactually, Anything else we could have otherwise observed would be also predicted on theism, uh, since theism is just completely uninformative and untestable, and seems to just lack uh, empirical content. Uh, but without further ado, um, let's move on to the final clip. Um, so last part is now we can get into partial justifications for evolutionary animal suffering. The reason why I call them partial justifications is that no amount of beauty or aestheticness in the world could ever justify um, the um, the horrendous suffering that a creature or an individual would have occurred to them, especially if that creature ends up forming thoughts like, I wish I was never born, right? Mm -hmm. The world being aesthetic doesn't justify that fully. That's why we need defeat. We need defeat as the normative constraint on what's justified to be in the picture here. If um, if we if God can achieve these goods that I have listed here, 
at the cost of there being certain evils, but those evils are, will be defeated. Then, um, you know, in a sense, God's off the hook, we could say, right? You know, God doesn't look bad in that sense. Yeah, you know, God is completely justified in what he's done. So here are some reasons you might ask, well, then why God, why would God instantiate kind of evolutionary process, right? Or something like that. Given our destructive model of creation, I could say, well, there's a bunch. There's aesthetic, teleological, canonic, ancestral, and last one, Christus Redemptor, which I really like. These are some goods that we can actually derive from the um, for evolutionary suffering. For example, nature as a work of art, the, uh, the kind of beauty found in nature or these, um, you know, evolutionary processes uh, such as, you know, competition, predation and things of that sort is, is what Sh John Schneider calls tragic beauty. Um, there's a kind of uh, sublime, um, you know, uh, kind of tragedy happening where there's beauty to be observed, but we also can kind of see a sad drama playing out when predation occurs and things of that sort, that, that an animal was able to flourish, but at the cost of another animal kind of playing out like in a tragic piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, also then you have aesthetic agency, which is that uh, the universe is allowed to, or nature is allowed to develop in multiple beautiful ways, um, but um, that can also um, occur in many bad states of affairs obtaining. So um, now we have teleological, right? And this is what I just talked about, the distribution intensity of evil that will likely result in saints, right? You know, people say that, you know, there is more suffering in the animal kingdom than there is in, you know, for humans. And if that's the case, then there is much more opportunity for saintliness in the multi-billion year process of evolution for animals than there has been for humans. And so in a sense, then animals have actually, have actually been given greater opportunities for saintliness than we have. Mm -hmm. um, and given my theodical story, they'll be able to develop that in the afterlife fully. Then we have canonic. The exemplification of self-emptying victims participating in Christ's passion. Kenosis is the doctrine that Christ self-emptied himself on the cross um, so that he could suffer for our sins. And in the same way, um, nature is a cruciform that animals play a role where they suffer so that other animals can exist and live that the proliferation of certain species are at the cost of certain animals existences. Um, but they participate in Christ's passion since Christ participated in all the suffering that he atoned for. And I think that that also includes um, the future uh, deification of animals themselves. And so in a sense, this is a great, great uh, value exemplified in the world. The fact that nature is a cruciform and that Christ's passion um, was also uh, of the canonic type. Then ancestral connections. This is from um, Robin Collins, right? The entire web of life is interrelated. And the entire web of life is interrelated and are great goods and lasting goods in the sense that we are in relationship, we have a relationship um, through ancestry to all of life. Um, and then Christus Redemptor, the great good of creatures apprehending the reality of Christ as a benevolent universal redeemer. That if, that if, God is to do good by the victims of evolution, then he must be able to redeem also evolution, right? And, and and Robin Collins also on your podcast talked about that. He said it would look something like instead of there being harsh competition and predation, there would be a redemption to a interrelatedness among creatures, a harmonious cooperation among creatures. And so the real question becomes, when we observe these teleological evils and evolutionary evils, the question is, well, can God redeem it? And the question answer is yes, given that God has infinite resources, then how will God redeem it? And I think that these are some reasons how God will redeem it. He will deify and resurrect creatures so that they can defeat their sufferings and know how God loved them and endorse the lives that they lived. And God will also redeem uh, the harsh conditions of evolution, such as competition and predation, and have that transform into interrelatedness and harmony. And if that's the case, and we can provide a theistic eschatology that doesn't take any probability hits on theism, then we have dis we have screened off, we have successfully screened off all the discontent from retired power of evolutionary animal suffering, 
and therefore this is no longer evidence for naturalism. Right, so he, he lists off um, um, some partial justifications of evolutionary animal suffering. I don't think any of them work, but we can sift through them. The first is aesthetic beauty. Uh, he admits that this doesn't justify particularly horrendous suffering, but I'm struggling to see how it could even be a, ch a partial justification for seemingly gratuitous evil. For one, I'm not convinced of any sort of aesthetic realism. It seems plausible to me that aesthetic judgments express something like sentiments or beliefs about sentiments, rather than beliefs about objective features of objects. But even if I was an aesthetic realist, I'm not convinced that the suffering we observe in nature is beautiful on the whole. In fact, I think a lot of it uh, seems extremely ugly. Uh, look at the most disgusting, foul cases of uh, parasitism, such as zombie ant fungus. My intuition that those are aesthetically distasteful uh, is much stronger than my intuition that predator-prey cycles involve tragic beauty. For two, I don't see how aesthetic considerations are morally relevant. Beauty may add value to the world, but I don't see how that could ever justify allowing uh, death or suffering, or overriding other wrong-making properties of actions. When deliberating what action one morally should do, aesthetic judgments rarely come up in that context. Like, it would be really weird if I was like, hmm, killing Jane seems wrong, but it's also, uh, it also has this tragic beauty to it. Uh, so that, you know, counts in favor of its being right. Uh, it seems like a very bizarre uh, scenario. For three, if anything, appealing to aesthetic considerations entailed from the suffering in nature seems to be evidence for Draper's aesthetic deism over uh, theism. Since on theism, we'd expect God to maximize goodness generally, not aesthetic beauty. Uh, finally, it seems logically possible that there could have been a world just as beautiful as this one, but with no horrific animal suffering, death, predation, and parasitism. Uh, since it's logically possible, God could have actualized that world instead. Next, he says animals are given more opportunities for saintliness due to their suffering. Uh, but an but non-human animals are not moral agents. Though. They have no concept of virtues, so I have no idea what it means for them to develop saintliness. So uh, this just seems to be something like an anthropomorphic fallacy, unless I'm missing the point here. Uh, but moving on, next is canonic goods. Uh, he says some animals suffer and die for the existence and proliferation of other animals, and in that way they bear resemblance to Christ who died for our sins, and this is of great value. An obvious point is that this lowers the prior theism, since you would have to be tacking on specific uh, Christian commitments onto theism, as well as a specific Christian axiology, uh, but none of these are entailments of Bayer theism, so tacking them on to explain evolutionary evil significantly lowers the prior of the theistic hypothesis unless you independently motivate them. Even if we grant the Christian commitments, uh, it hardly seems like the canonic value, as great as it is, constitutes an outweighing moral reason to per permit the a horrific evil related to millions of years of brutal evolution by natural selection, especially when we think about the overwhelming intrinsic badness of the pain of being eaten alive and uh, you know other horrors involved in evolution. Again, this would be God using the agonizing suffering of sentient creatures to bring about valuable states of affairs. Uh, unless we're consequentialists, this seems uh, immoral. Uh, but lastly, uh, canonic value does not explain many instances of uh, biologically gratuitous evolutionary suffering that did not contribute to the proliferation or biological goals of the species, so that's left unexplained. Next we have ancestral connections, but I'm not sure how this uh, justifies evolutionary evil at all. Uh, God could have logically actualized a world where the good of deep ancestral connections and the interrelated web of life, which goes back uh, many years, is present. Uh, but do not involve the sorts of horrors we knew, know to be involved in uh, evolution by natural selection. Even if, for some reason, creating creatures specifically through a brutal evolutionary process is, a log is logically necessary for some unknown reason to bring about the good of ancestral connection, uh, does the good of ancestral connections outweigh uh, all the seemingly gratuitous evils such as sentient beings um, being the victims of uh, horrific predation and parasitism? such that it would constitute a morally sufficient reason to permit these things. Uh, on most deontological theories, and by deontological I mean theories of rightness and wrongness generally, not deontology in particular, uh, it, it would not be a morally sufficient reason. Uh, finally, uh, Christus Redemptor, uh, again, um, this tax on specifically Christian commitments onto theism, uh, lowering its prior probability. Uh, he claims that uh, it doesn't take any probability hits on theism, but uh, I think it does. In addition, it seems the good of uh, animal redemption is merely a compensatory good, not a justificatory good. 
Uh, again, if I permit the rape of someone and then give them a million dollars, that does not justify my permitting their rape in the first place. It was still an immoral action. And while this story of God's ordaining uh, animal suffering through a multi-million year process so that they can ultimately be redeemed is certainly a story you can tell after observing the data of evolutionary animal suffering, it's not one we would expect to be true antecedently that is true prior to observing the data. So once again, he runs afoul of the problem of um, independent motivation and thus incurs, incurs theoretical cost. So that's it. That's Tim's response to the problem of evolutionary evil, and this is my rejoinder. I don't think his response is successfully defend theism from the argument, at least not without running afoul of many theoretical issues. And I think the argument from evolutionary evil, even in the face of Tim's responses, remains a great obstacle and evidential hurdle for theistic belief. That's all, YouTube. This is Truth Teller, signing off.